Good morning, good morning, good morning. We greet you in the matchless, wonderful, magnificent name of Jesus the Christ. We're blessed and excited that uh, you've chosen, as the Lord have allowed, to share with us during this tremendous worship experience. So we praise God for you in this time of a virtual worship. We pray, don't know when, but we pray that hopefully very soon, sooner rather than later, we'll be able to start congregating in our sanctuary safely so. But until then, we take advantage of this opportunity to share with you in the precious name of Jesus the Christ. Well, before we go any further, let's talk to God. God, we've already said good morning to you, and we're grateful that you never tire of hearing from us, and we thank you for the privilege, for the opportunity that we can hear from you. We pray now that you would just be with us, guide us, cover us, with your grace, with your mercy. God, I pray that there will be an anointing upon this, our worship experience, to the extent that lives will be changed. People who know you not as their personal Savior will be saved. So, dear God, with great expectation now, we commit this time to you in the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray, amen. Well, it's time now we want to just share a little bit in song and uh, immediately thereafter we'll come back because I assure you there is a word from the Lord. Let's be blessed in song. When you're down and out And when you're on the street When evening falls so hard I will comfort you I'll take your part When darkness comes and I will. 
Well, thank God for minister and uh, the ministry of music. I want to remind those who are giving themselves to singing praises to God that uh, as last week there will be a rehearsal time right here at the main campus for our choir as we prepare for our graduation Sunday, the last Sunday in the month of May, as we honor and as we salute those of our young people who have attained another milestone in life, we congratulate them in advance and together we'll have our worship experience outdoors at our amphitheater right here again at the main campus, 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock next Sunday morning. And in the meantime, again, don't forget our choir rehearsal as last week. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, on last week, we looked at the book of Joshua, chapter 6, and uh, moving into chapter 7. I want to continue looking at that word from the book of Joshua this week as we look at the sin of Achan. The sin of Achan. And as we stand in this place, as we say, Lord, preach. Lord, preach. Lord, preach. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go with me if you have your Bibles to chapter 7 of the book of Joshua, and we will walk through portions of this chapter as we look at it now. But on last week, we saw how God employed a heavenly strategy in order to deliver to the Jews the land that God had previously promised them. God had to remove that obstacle, that hindrance, that mountain, those walls of Jericho, which kept the Jews from taking delivery of their promised land. Although the strategy was the furthest thing from being militarily astute. It was a God strategy, which only required the obedience of the people to be successful. I remind us that a God strategy is always better than a good strategy. God called the people to obey a strategy that was nonsensical, non, non-irrational. It was unthinkable, yet it was God's strategy. The strategy was this as we looked last week. He told them to circle the city a total of 13 times. 
once per day for six days and on the seventh day, march around the city of Jericho for seven times. March not haphazardly, rather march in a predetermined order. And here is the kicker. He says, march quietly. Don't say a word. And at the end of the 13th time around the city, upon the orders from Joshua, he told them then to shout. When the shout was given, God honored their obedience by bringing down the walls of Jericho. And as you know, when the walls came down, the people went in and possessed their land of promise. Upon possessing the city of Jericho, Joshua gave to the people the following instructions. Verse 17, he says, And the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein. To the Lord, only Rahab the harlot shall live. She and all that are with her in the house because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed when ye take of the accursed thing. Make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But then he says, but all of the silver, the gold, vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. And after every great victory, there's a time when we are challenged to ultimately remember that God did it. For if we get caught up in the celebration of the victory, we may be inclined to think that we did it. And when we begin to credit ourselves for what God has done, pride can come in. And as Proverbs 16, verse 18 reminds us that pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before fall. And now we find ourselves in Joshua chapter 7. It begins like this. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Before the orders from Joshua could get cold and the euphoria of victory could become lukewarm. The people started sinning. They were told, I remind you, to destroy the city. And everything in the city except for Rahab and her household. And here they are, taking for themselves what God, had said was to be his and his alone. But the question comes, why couldn't they accept the fact that because it was God's victory, God had the right and the authority to do with the spoils as he wanted. And God wanted those things for himself and everything else to be destroyed. But Achan decided that he wanted to keep some of the spoils for himself. How selfish, how 
greedy, how covetous he was, God had allowed him and the people to experience a victory that they did not even have to fight for. And had given them land that they did not have to work for. And as if that wasn't enough, Achan wanted to keep for himself those things that God wanted set aside for himself and for ministry. Oh, brothers and sisters, people still want for themselves what God has said should be for ministry. And it's easy for some people, if you will, to make an excuse as to why they ought to have what God says belong to him. But, but be careful, be careful, because the plight of Achan also awaits those who will take for themselves what God has said belong to him. Oh, oh, but I want to tell you this morning, Achan wasn't the only person who messed up. Joshua messed up. The people also messed up. But I hear you asking the question, how? Because nothing is said about Joshua having messed up, how did he and the people mess up? I'm glad you asked. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth Aven, east of Bethel, and told them this. He said to them, go up and scout the land. They responded by obeying Joshua's command. After returning to Joshua, they reported to him, listen, boss, listen, general, listen, Mr. Joshua, listen, bro, whatever the name may have been. Don't send all of the people, but send about two or 3,000 men to attack I. Some people may say AI. But since the people of I, of Ai, are so few, don't wear out all of our people. The word says in Joshua 7, 4, about 3,000 men went up there. But this is what happened when they went up there. The word says they fled from the men of I. The men there struck down about 36 of them and chased them outside of the city gates to the quarries. The word says striking them down on the descent. And as a result, the people lost heart. Mm. While still at Jericho, the place of their monumental victory, Joshua sent men to I to spy out the area. The men, of course, do as they were ordered. Return says that this area is ripe for the taking. Mm. In fact, General, we don't need a full battalion. We only need two to 3,000 men, and the rest of the soldiers can just stay here, recuperate, chill, get ready for the next battle. And so Joshua says, okay, you guys go. He says from Jericho, you guys go up to I, but a strange thing happened. Joshua's soldiers were soundly defeated. The Bible says that about 36 men lost their lives. What happened? 
Nobody died at Jericho, and it was a major victory. But they lose 36 soldiers to a minor foe. What happened? Why did it happen? Notice, if you will, that prior to going to Jericho, Joshua submits to the Lord's, what I call, get ready to be blessed plan. At the behest of God, Joshua had to circumcise the uncircumcised males. And he was challenged to worship the Lord before he received the promised blessing from the Lord. Joshua in turn, followed these specific directions given him by the Lord. He was with the Lord, and the Lord was with him. Oh, what a word. If you don't get anything else about Brother Joshua this morning, I say Joshua was with the Lord, and the Lord was with Joshua. But now, Nothing is said about Joshua's interaction with the Lord prior to him ordering the failed attack on I. Oh, y'all missed that. I said nothing is said about Joshua's interaction with the Lord prior to ordering this failed attack on I. As I look at Joshua's response to I, I can't help but reflect on what one preacher said as he challenged his audience to beware of two foes. Good God. Beware of two foes, two opponents, those two being fear and confidence. Fear and confidence. He, he went on to say this, that self-confidence is a real aspect of the flesh that we need to be careful of. But fear had governed them through the wilderness. And what fear does is that it makes situations, it makes problems, it, it makes enemies bigger than they actually are. But self-confidence does the opposite. It makes the situation seem smaller and more significant than it really is. And this is the situation here. Joshua and the people, they are full of self-confidence. Mm. He's figuratively saying to God, God, you took care of big Jericho. We can handle little I. <laughs> God, you took care of big Jericho. We can handle little I. No longer was Joshua exercising faith in God. He was now exercising faith in himself and in his army. Oh, <laughs> What a major mistake we often make. For the Bible declares in the words of the wise sage as told us in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 7, says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Then he says, Be not wise. In thine own eyes, fear the Lord and depart from evil. But literally, we see a man who said, ceased to walk by faith and who begins to walk by sight and in the power of his own might. That's what Joshua was doing right now. Upon 
the soldiers return from their devastating, from their demoralizing defeat. The Bible describes it this way. And the men of I smoked of them about 36 men. For they chased them from before the gate, even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down. Wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Oh, hear me, children of God. These, these people, this nation even, had lost heart. The hearts of their fighting soldiers melted and became as water. The original text describes them as becoming worthless. Whenever we attempt anything in our own power as a result of our own will, without the presence and the power of God, we make ourselves and our efforts null and void. We become worthless. Their efforts proved to be worthless. Could it be? Could it be that some of us continue to suffer defeat after defeat because we continue to do what we want to do without having been given authorization by God? <laughs> without having received the anointing and the power of God, without having received any direction from God. Maybe, maybe things would turn out differently if we would seek God, hear me well, to keep us out of trouble rather than seeking God to get us out of trouble. I don't know about you, but I'd rather be kept out of trouble than having to be gotten out of trouble. After having suffered this humiliating defeat, Joshua does what he should have done before sending his troops to war. He goes to God. Isn't that like us? <laughs> I mean, we'll jump at any task, at any situation with our own concocted solution. And when it doesn't work out, we go to God then. Lord, have mercy. Yes, he, Joshua goes to God now because he does not know about the sin of Achan. He does not know that Achan had committed this sin. Therefore, he goes poor mouthing to God. And after God listens to Joshua's poor mouthing for four verses, Obviously, God, by this point, had had enough. <laughs> so God interrupts his poor mouth. And he tells him, Joshua, get up. More often than not, God is not impressed with our religious posturing. God, you know I'm doing the best I can. God, here I, here I am, poor me. God, I'm your guy. God says, hey, listen, I know what happened, but I'm tired of your poor mouth, and you need to listen to me now. So get up. Get, get up. You're, you're posturing. You, you, you've done enough of that. Just get up. 
And God gets right to the point. He tells Joshua that they have suffered defeat because they have sinned. Mm. Although we're not told this, I take liberty in believing that had Joshua consulted God before sending his troops into war, God would have told him, don't do it. And would have told him that Israel had sinned. But because Joshua did what he did, he got what he got. Oh, let me say that again. Because Joshua did what he did, he got what he got. Israel had done wrong. Verse 11 says, sinning against the agreement which I made with them. They've even taken of the cursed thing, acting falsely like thieves. They have put it among their goods. This is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They will turn their backs and run from their enemies because they have been set apart for destruction. God still talks to Joshua. He says, I will no longer be with you unless you remove from among you what is set apart. I won't do it. All of your religious posturing, all of your poor mouthing, all of your begging will not move me until you deal with this sin problem. Get up, God says to Joshua. Consecrate the people and say to them, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. Oh, brothers and sisters, sin will keep a child of God from experiencing the blessings and the protection of God. And I want to tell you something about hidden sin. Although Joshua was not aware of it, and although Achan thought he had gotten by with it, hidden sin is never hidden from God. And unconfessed sin is never hidden unknown to God. <laughs> I, I say it again. Hidden sin is never hidden from God. And unconfessed sin is never unknown to God. God knows whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever you've done, Nobody else may know about it, but God knows. And to fast forward a little, after doing as God had commanded, it was discovered that Achan had committed this grievous sin. However, notice that God doesn't immediately identify Achan as the perpetrator of sin. In fact, God says that Israel has sinned. Oh, good God. I said, God says that Israel has sinned. It, it was as though God was saying that Whatever one member did, the whole body became responsible. For Israel really was only as strong 
as its weakest member. All too often, in today's modern church, in today's modern body of Christ, when sin is discussed and committed, we speak in terms of what he did, what she did, what they did, while accepting no personal responsibility whatsoever. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, we got the victory. We beat them. But there is a refusal to take any personal responsibility for a loss or a defeat. Listen to our conversations. The conversation of baptized Bible-carrying, Bible-believing, sometimes Bible-reading Christians. Ah! This is what he did. This is what she did. They did it. But God says you're part of the body. And he does not say Achan. He says Israel has sinned. Just maybe, I, I don't know what it was, but just maybe the sin was that of not praying for its leaders. Just maybe. The sin was that of not encouraging the leaders nor their soldiers. Just maybe. Their sin was not serving as they had uh, an opportunity and the ability to serve. Just maybe. Israel's sin was displaying a critical spirit. Just maybe. Their sin was that they had become lifted up in pride. Therefore, they overlooked carrying out the mandate, the command of God. Just maybe. Maybe they were duplicitous in Achan's cover-up of his sin. I saw it, but I didn't want to get involved. I didn't want to say anything about it. I didn't want to make bad matters Worse. Just maybe. Israel's sin was that they took the glory that was rightly God for themselves. Can you see them? The walls of Jericho are down. They are walking in and about the city. One says to another, Look at what we did. Others says, yeah, we soundly defeated them, didn't we? And we lost nobody. Look at what we did. Just look at our people going through the city, triumphantly so. Oh, yes, yes. Perhaps they took glory for themselves, but... Whatever the sin was, God said of them to Joshua, Israel has sinned. And although God again does not name the one who stole from him, he does make it so that the people themselves will find out who the culprit is. And once that person has been identified, that this is what he tells them to do. Now, God says, I'm not telling you who did it. I'm going to set up a way that you will find out for yourselves. Y'all know each other so well. <laughs> you, you know who's saved, who's not saved. You know who the good Christians are. You know who the good Christians are not. Y'all know, but I'm just let you find out 
for yourselves. And so this is what he tells them to do. Upon discovering who the culprit is, he says, he who is caught with the devoted things shall be destroyed by fire, along with all that belongs to him. He has violated the covenant of the Lord and has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. And so, after setting up the way in which the culprit would become known to everybody, Achan finally speaks up, speaks out. He publicly owns up to what he has done. And this is what happened. Listen, brothers and sisters in Christ, there are always some consequences to sin. What we experience for this sin or that sin may not be the same here in the earth realm, but there are always some consequences to sin. As I told you before, just because many of the people don't know, God always knows. And just because you don't talk about it, just because you don't confess it, God still knows. After telling them what to do to Achan, the word says, and I read it to you, then Joshua, together with all Israel, took Achan son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold wedge, his sons and daughters, his cattle, donkeys, sheep, his tent, and all that he had to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then it says, all Israel stoned him. And after they had stoned the rest, they burned them. Over Achan, they heaped up a large pile of rocks which remain to this day. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. Therefore, that place has been called the Valley of Achor ever since. Notice, notice here that God requires he requires a reckoning for sin. You cannot steal from God and get by. Pastor F. Gordon, I don't know him personally, but in reading some of his works, he concluded his sermon on this text in a way that I think is appropriate and I shared with you now. He said that Achan's sin brought trouble upon the whole nation and he is judged accordingly. And the place of judgment became known as the Valley of Achor. Achor means trouble. Achan brought trouble upon the nation. But further along in God's word in the book of Hosea chapter 2, this valley is spoken of in a different way. As Hosea speaks to Israel, chapter 2, verses 14 and 16, he says, Therefore, 
I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. There I will give her back her vineyards and will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. There she will sing as in the days of her youth. As in the day she came up out of Egypt. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. In Joshua's day, this valley of Achor, it meant trouble. It meant sin judged. But when you get over to Hosea, God says that this valley of Achor that meant trouble for you, I'm going to give to you as a door of hope. So what does that mean? In this context, Israel had been cast away because of her sin. And trouble had ensued. But here was this great promise that this valley of trouble would also be made into a door of hope. In other words, he was going to restore them to a relationship with him once again through the trouble that would come upon them. And it says, you will sing in that day, just like the day when you come up out of the land of Egypt. In other words, it is a deliverance from sin, but it is a door of hope. That's what I want to leave you with this morning. You may be as Achan was. And God does again have to deal with sin. But thanks be unto God. God also provides us with a door of hope. Sometimes when you are in a troublesome situation because of what you yourself had done. Remember that God also has a door of hope. That no matter who has knocked you down because of what you've done, no matter what has knocked you down because of what you've done, no matter the stoning, from people that you've had to endure because of what you have done. There is good news this morning that God still has a door of hope. That's what I want to tell you. God still has for you a door of hope. Yeah, you've sinned. You've messed up, as I've said in a sermon previously. But God still has a door of hope just for you. And I don't know about you, but I'm thankful this morning that no matter what I have done, the sin that I've committed. God still did not close that door for you. That door is still wide open. A door of hope. A door of hope. Were you giving, given another chance Yes, it's been rough because of what you did. 
But God still says to you, there is hope. Yeah, God was angry because of what we did, because it broke his heart. But God still says to us this morning, there is a door of hope. Will you walk through? That door is Jesus the Christ. That door is our wonderful Savior that says, Come unto me. Come unto me. Come through that door that I've opened just for you. <laughs> I know how to restore. I know how to give you another chance. Will you do it this morning? If you are not accepted him as Lord and Savior, come right now. Wherever you are, just bow your heads and tell God this, God, I'm sorry. I own up to my sins. God, forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me. And for those of you who are not saved, invite him in. What? After repenting of your sins, invite him in. He will do it. He will come in and be your savior. He will do it. You without a church home, we invite you to come and be a part of this church family. No, we're not perfect. But thanks be unto God. God can do We're people who love the Lord. We just simply ask you to come and be a part. And if we were here together, we would just simply say as you come, welcome home. Welcome home. Thank you so much for allowing us to come into your domain, wherever you are, and worship with you on this beautiful Lord's Day. We ask that you continue to support us with your generous gifts, whatever it is. We thank you and we thank God for you for a spirit of giving. Thank you so much. Well, our time has come and gone again. I cannot thank you enough for just sharing with us in this virtual worship experience. Don't forget our choir rehearsal on Tuesday evening and on Sunday morning here at the main campus at our amphitheater. We will celebrate, we will honor our graduates, those who have obtained another milestone in life. Come and celebrate with us. Bring your lawn chairs, whatever. Sit out as we worship together. Well, as I say to you once again, to God be the glory for the great things that he has done, he is doing, and in faith, he will do. Until we meet again, you be blessed now. <laughs>